Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode, and I'm really excited about this one. I think that it is pretty unique and also very important. We're going to be talking about love, specifically the fact that this God commands love. He commands us to love him, and he commands us to love one another. Now, this sounds like something very pretty, right? What could be more important than summing everything up to love? But I think there's more to this than what it may seem. So I want to explore the concept of love within the Bible. And at the end, we're going to cover through three questions. Why does God command love? Can love even be real if it is commanded and or threatened? And is there any good evidence that God loves us? So stay with me today. We're going to use a ton of verses as we go through all of this information. And I want to start at the very beginning. Let's make the case for the fact that God does indeed command love. I'm going to start by just reading you a few verses here. We have Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we only really need to cite this one verse. It cannot get more clear. In fact, the context is this is in response to Jesus's followers saying, hey, what is the most important commandment? What is the law? And Jesus is saying, first and foremost, love your God. It is a command. And we're mainly going to be focusing on that love your God part, not so much the love your neighbor part, although we could definitely handle that in a second episode. From the Old Testament, good old Deut 6, 5, we have love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is actually the verse that Jesus is referencing in the previous verse. So this is something that we actually have continuity on from the Old to the New Testament, which is much more rare than one might think. Going back to the New Testament, we have now Paul speaking in Romans 13, 10, love is the fulfillment of of the law. And in Colossians 3.14, we have, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So it is very clear. The Bible seems to be pro-love. God is absolutely commanding us to love him and to love others. The reason I don't want to get into the whole neighbors thing here is because in both Old and New Testament, we have good reason to believe that when God is talking or Jesus is talking about loving your neighbors, forgiving your neighbors, etc., it really means other Jews or non Gentiles, which would be problematic for the very fact that it seems like God doesn't care or love everyone, but we'll get to that in a later point. So this is the case, and I get this thrown in my face all the time. I'll be talking about how God endorsed slavery or genocide or the murder of children, and they're like, yeah, but Brandon, that's Old Testament. You don't understand the context of the time and place. We can't judge people back then like we do today. And furthermore, haven't you read Everything's About Love? We're just called to love God and love one another. See, it's so beautiful, but I don't think it's that beautiful to be commanded by the creator of the universe on how we're supposed to feel about him, especially if he has not given us good reason to feel that way about him or even to believe in him. Honestly, this is what first got me thinking about even doing this video. The very concept commanded to love seems beyond oxymoronic. But I want to make sure we understand what we're talking about. So first, going back to those verses I mentioned, what kind of love is the Bible referring to? If you remember being a child, you probably heard at one point the three kinds of love in the Bible. You might remember the Greek words eros, philios, and agape. Now, there's actually a couple more if you're really pulling things apart and getting nuanced and looking at some of the context, but those will work for our purposes. And that is the Greek, so the New Testament translations, at least of the verses I just read, are all for the most part agape. And I think it's actually pronounced agape, and then there's agapo or agapo. Now this is very nuanced, but two of the verses happen to be the agapo, used more in the context of an action, the action of love, the action of showing love. In fact, that first verse that I read you, the one in Matthew where Jesus says what the greatest command is, when he says love there, it's the act of showing love to God, agapo, where in Romans, Paul is using the word agape, which is a noun that represents the concept of love itself. So they're pretty much interchangeable for our purposes here today, but I wanted to point it out. And then I did use the verse from Dute, and there's another one that's very similar in Leviticus, and they are using the Hebrew word ahava, which again is pretty much a direct correlation with the Greek agape. So we're good. We're not talking about philos or eros or anything like that. This is pretty darn straightforward. This is love in its purest form. But to take it a step further, I want to define love biblically speaking. After all, the Bible should, if it's giving us all these commands of love and the importance of love, tell us what love really looks like 
like. And mainly, I think we're going to look at the first Corinthians 13, four through seven. This is going to be extremely common. And we're going to come back to this when we do our little test to see, do we have good evidence that God really loves us? So here it is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That is our New Testament definition of love. And yes, that love is also agape. So we're being very consistent here. And then just for kicks, I want to read 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. What a verse. Hang on to that as we get into some of the questions that we're going to cover. So hopefully at this point, we have set the base that we are indeed commanded to love. We understand what that command means, and we understand what the Bible has to say about love and how it defines or describes it. So let's get to our questions. Question one, and this one I think is a really interesting one to consider. Why does God command love? Now, there's many angles we could take to zero in on this question, but I want to pose one specific one to you. Why does a perfect being require or command anything at all, right? Maybe we're already assuming too much, but I believe that God requiring or commanding us to love is that he desires or wants or needs to be loved, especially considering the consequences that we'll get to in a minute if we don't. It must be of God's most high value, his most important hierarchy of needs, if you will, which also makes a lot of sense when you consider that this God is obviously a man-made concept and love is one of our most basic and desired needs. But we projected that onto God. In reality, if if a God were existing outside of time and space, and for whatever whim decided to create us lowly creatures from the dirt, why would he require, command, need, or want our love? I think it is a genuine question. I think it's one that gets taken for granted, and it's something I'd like to really back the train up to. And I guess I've described it in two different ways. Why does God want love? And then if indeed he does want it, why command it? So let's just get past that first question. Let's assume somehow this perfect being is not quite perfect and needs something from us, which is hilarious the way he talks down to us, and what he needs is that love. But what is love actually? Well, in John 14, 15, Jesus could not be more clear. To love me is to obey me, to follow my commands. So not only does this perfect being need, want, require, or desire love, but the way that he expects that love to manifest itself is through obedience, through servitude. That's even stranger. And then the second part of this is just, again, assuming he does need all this, and this is the way that he needs or wants it, why command it? Would a perfect, all-knowing God really think that's the best way to get love? Which is going to lead us to question two. Can it even be real love if it is required, commanded, or threatened. So I guess we can just transition into that question right now. My initial response is no, that can't be love, which an all-perfect, all-knowing God would know. Is this God so empty inside, so broken, so imperfect that not only does he need love, but he's willing to settle for love that he commands and threatens for? Think about that. This is a huge point to me. This alone shows me the fallibility, the ineptness, the man-madeness of this particular God concept. What real God would need love, would choose to command it, and would settle for love that was given to earn a prize, to avoid a punishment, or simply for the fact that it is what is expected from us? Not the God that this Bible claims to have, not the God that most Christians believe they're worshiping. There's no way the world's most benevolent being of all time anywhere that created everything needs Needs us to love him and in these ways. So let's explore this second question. Is it even love then if it's commanded or threatened? Well, let's read some verses first. Going back to do 30, 15 through 20. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. I just want to point out very clearly, God from the earliest time with his people is putting out two options, accept me, follow me, love me, obey me, or don't. 
And if you do those things, there's life and prosperity to be had, either in this life or the next, depending on the context in the Old versus New Testament. But if you don't, you and your children cannot live. This is during the part of the Bible where God is still punishing the children for the sins of the father. He'll flip flop and change his mind on this like 14 times in the next few books. What about the prettiest verse that's probably ringing in your heads right now? John 3, 16, Brandon doesn't get any more clear than this. We all know how it starts. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Hey, look, Brandon, this is self-sacrificial. This is God loving everyone. It says the world, even though we'll make excuses about the context of meanings of what these people really meant when they talked about the world, because when we don't believe in a literal flood, we'll say that when God flooded the whole world, what it really meant was the local area. But here, when we're trying to express something greater about salvation, and it says that God loved the whole world, we'll actually just try to mean the whole world, even though it's clear God has some very high ordered level of predestination and cannot possibly love or try to show love to everyone in the world. You don't get that when you start with a chosen people group in one area with one time with one book that you then let spread trickle down and water down over the generations like it's absolutely a ridiculous concept the second part of that verse is one that we don't talk about enough so that whosoever believes in him shall what not perish ah there's a condition to this love Remember that when we talk about if this God really loves us here in a minute. Another New Testament verse, let's do Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, we can argue all day about hell. Is this word translated from Guyana? Is that just a place of kind of trash and death that was a local spot Jesus would have known about and he's trying to drop some imagery of something bad? I don't care. I really don't care about hell versus annihilation. Yes, I think hell is worse than annihilation, but we have some major issues here that we're still seeing threats from God, right? We're trying to build the case that it is very clear in scripture that God does not only command love, but that he threatens those who would not. Well, Brandon, some of the threats are if you don't obey, if you don't follow his law. But remember what we learned to love God is to obey God. They are synonymous. Let me give you a couple more here. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. Now, this is a very clear verse making a case for the biblical version of hell. Everlasting means everlasting, ongoing destruction forever. Again, doesn't matter, but it's right here. And no matter what this is supposed to mean, it is 100% a threat of what will happen if you do not obey and thus love God. How about Revelation 2015? Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. How do you get your name written in the book of life? Well, that's up for debate because Christians can't agree on salvation doctrine. So the quick, very arguable answer here is first people have to believe in Jesus for their salvation. Some people stop there and some people say, then our acts should show that because faith without works is dead. So if our faith is to be actualized or activated to achieve that salvation, it's going to be evident in how we live our life. Again, another fun debate that really doesn't matter to me, but that Christians cannot agree on. And either way, this means there is a clear cut if you do not meet the standard of what God has commanded or required from you to the lake of fire you go. And one more verse for this section, Hebrews 10, 26 through 27. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Again, just a little more ammo for those of you that want to make your case that it's works-based and some additional pictures of the fact that there is consequence for not giving God what he wants from us, love, obedience. So again, the question at stake here was, can this love even be real if it's commanded or threatened? I've given you enough examples here that hopefully it's not even up for debate that God is commanding this of us and that he is threatening us with bad, negative things, however you construe that, if he doesn't get his way. I think that's very clear here. Under those conditions, can it be love? People get mad when I do this because I bring it into a more real sense, human relationships. But even if you already had an affection for someone, if that person told you it was a requirement to love them, if they commanded it of you, if they threatened to hurt you if you didn't, would you find yourself a- willing 
to even love this person and be capable of even loving this person. I think if we're all being honest, the actual answer like across the board should 100% be no. So why does it change with God? Because he's not human, because he's greater than us, because he made us. Your parents are greater than you and they made you. If your parents said these kinds of things to you, like the verses I just read, should you and could you love them? And even if you attempted to, could it ever actually be genuine? I really do not believe so. And I do not see what the separation of God to human all of a sudden makes this concept real. We didn't change. We're still human. And the way our brains work with that is a rejection of the person that hurts us, that threatens us, that commands us to feel a certain way. We could go down a whole philosophical conversation about are we even in control of who we choose to love? Or is this something that just happens to us organically because of who they are, how they treat us, how we feel when we're with them or not with them, etc. And of course, we could get into if love is even ever selfless or if it's always selfish in nature. It doesn't really matter here because regardless of how you define love in those terms, I cannot see ever getting to a place where we could actually love someone that says we have to, and if not, death and hell, punishment, everlasting torment, take your pick. And the second part of this question, before we get to our last point on if there's any evidence that God even loves us, is the free will issue. The number one excuse for the problem of evil or suffering is God had to give us free will to choose to love him to follow him, to obey him. Because if he made us in the fashion like a robot that already did, he would be robbing us of our choice to love, and thus it would not be real love. And so he had to give us this gift of free will that has a byproduct of evil and suffering. That's the quick apologetic on it. But if that love is still coerced from us or forced from us or threatened to us, how is it any different than if he just built us already loving him? It's still not a true choice. A gun to the head is never a true choice choice. The second there's any indication that we lose our free will that is so important to the excuse of the problem of suffering and evil, it's game over. And the very fact that God is willing to send us to hell or to permanent death or to misfortune here on our time on earth simply because we have not been able to believe in him, feel like we know him, feel like we have a good reason to love him for any other reason than the selfish seeking out of eternal pleasure like heaven or the fear of some kind of of punishment or torture is not real love, in my opinion. You're more than welcome to disagree with that, but I would be sad for you that you have lowered your standards of what love is, could be, and should be so much just to try to feel like you're appeasing this God. I have real love in my life. I have love for my friends and am loved by them. I have love for my wife and for my kids and am loved by them. I know what love is. And so far, it is completely lacking in any of the ways that God has demonstrated to us that we should love him. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclasts, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Joe, Oliver, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared, Carolina, and Christy, my atheist advocates, Anne, Elijah, Rocket, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel, or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine patrons. Thanks, and have a great day.